Okay, we're live. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Um, so today we're gonna do a guest lecture from uh, Naveen Kapaswamy here, who's uh, one of the researchers working on tactile um, manipulation, perception, feedback control uh, at Toyota Research Institute, just down the street. Uh, Naveen's actually got a really interesting background uh, from, I met him first uh, at, a, at a robotics conference. We had a really good conversation. We eventually convinced him to move to, to Cambridge here. Um, but he, he spent time at IIT in Italy, uh, working with some of the humanoid robots. Um, he spent time in, in, uh, in Zurich. Uh, he's, he's got a really good sort of connection to the, the way uh, the European community thinks about manipulation, which has been incredibly valuable for us. Uh, and, he's, and he's really leading a lot of the, the research directions on, on how do you think about tactile manipulation. Uh, so I thought better, why, uh, no one better to, to tell you the story of like, you know, how to think about contact than Naveen. So Naveen, thanks for agreeing to do this and please take it away. Thank you, Russ. So um, the, the same uh, caveats hold as uh, what Russ mentioned uh, during a number of his lectures, which is if you can show your face, I would love it because the more faces I see, the more excited I am. So actually, I still haven't figured out how to look at everyone's face. Uh, let's see if I can. Oh, there we go, the participant view. OK, so. Yeah, feel free to throw up your camera and uh, yeah, and uh, do interrupt me whenever you want. So as Russ mentioned, uh, my name is Naveen Kupuswamy. I'm uh, a researcher in uh, uh, the Toyota Research Institute, part of uh, Russ's manipulation group. Before I even get into the talk, what I want to at the outset tell you is the aim of this talk for me is very simple. I want all of you to go home with just one single message in your heads why not incorporate a tactile sensor into your problems? So what that means, what all are the ways in which you can incorporate such a sensor that we are gonna try and break down through the stock. Uh, and right at the outset, I can already tell you, there's some little biases which I will introduce uh, throughout this uh, talk. One, of course, I'm gonna cite uh, some examples which uh, I personally like and I personally chose for didactic purposes. So it doesn't necessarily mean they are the best examples in literature. Uh, I've also kind of uh, curtailed examples to fit our uh, lecture duration so that uh, um, we can actually uh, dive into a couple of them. Uh, I will of course uh, bring up out, uh, some of my own examples and I will often be citing uh, some examples from uh, the leading faculty at MIT simply because I'm most familiar with a lot of their work. And uh, as Russ said, they are just down the street from where our offices are, although we are all sitting at home right now. So let's begin. Now, a brief intro, as uh, Russ mentioned, um, I did my PhD at the University of Zurich uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, 2014 is when I graduated. And uh, the themes I covered in my PhD include uh, some stuff on human motion, uh, uh, modeling uh, the control of uh, multi of manipulators, but also specifically soft robotics through this continuum manipulator. That example you see right in the middle of your screen is this uh, soft octopus uh, gripper, which has tendons going through this uh, structure made of silicone, and it's meant to be an underwater robot. Uh, I was a postdoc for a couple of years at the Italian Institute of Technology, where uh, I worked on the iCub humanoid robot, which is this uh, little guy you see on the left there. And uh, lastly, um, uh, now at the Toyota Research Institute, I have this incredible opportunity to work with uh, some of the world's uh, leading experts uh, in several topics, but in particular with uh, some uh, really solid experts in soft robotics and in designing and constructing uh, complex uh, soft tactile sensors, in this case called the uh, soft bubble. So I wanted to quickly give you an outline of what we can expect from uh, today's lecture and um, uh, we'll dive deep into some examples. So the first part, let's break down this question, which uh, I personally find a lot of roboticists don't really quite grasp, which is what is tactile sensing and why is it needed? So it's not that they don't grasp it, they see parts of the puzzle and uh, sometimes looking at the whole really helps. Uh, specifically, I want to try and classify tactile sensors. Uh, and uh, today's lecture, for instance, comes purely from a bias that I carry as a control and uh, control engineer getting into robotics, which is 
I'm not really a sensor design person. So today's lecture will not get too deeply into the electronics of sensor design, into the transduction and how, what are the properties a tactile sensor can capture, et cetera. That, that is not really what I'm going for here. And uh, I will also reflect a distinct bias towards my favorite uh, type of tactile sensor, which is the camera-based tactile sensor right there. And uh, we'll dive deep into that and what that entails for manipulation. Uh, next, of course, I want to pick out two problems in uh, tactile perception, which I find uh, really interesting, and which I've also consumed some of my time in the recent years. And I'm going to pick out uh, a couple of examples in detail for doing some kind of tactile control. And uh, I want to throw in two outlook type questions, which is one, what does it mean to think about tactileness in a world where we have robots which are getting soft? And lastly, of course, the question which everybody who attends this lecture often poses, can we simulate this thing? And can we simulate it with Drake, for instance? So with that, let's begin. So I can't quite see all your faces yet, but um, if someone feels like pitching in, let me ask you the question, what is a tactile sensor for you? And why do you think we need it? Are there any, is there anybody who wants to throw up some guesses? If not, I'm going to ask uh, Terry or Meng to <laughs> jump in. What is a tactile sensor for you? It can tell me um, whether I'm in contact or not. So some kind of uh, sensation of your contact state. All right. Uh, maybe the texture and shape uh, of your uh, contact surface. Excellent point. Some aspect about the, the, the geometric features of the surface or the object being grabbed and uh, what you can do with them, of course, is uh, from these two responses gives you one spectrum, which is uh, sort of behavioral uh, level decisions. If it is this texture, do that action. If it is, uh, if you have made contact in this way, oh, perform that action. So. Um, as we tend to refer to that way of thinking, it's it's kind of, you can think of it as behavioral. But let's look at, uh, before we get into anything, my favorite demo, and this is one of those demonstrations which uh, once you do it yourself, it really blows your mind. So this demonstration combines tactile sensing with a closely related area of haptics and uh, into this uh, interactive demonstration where people are having these haptic gloves they're performing this uh, complex teleoperation uh, uh, maneuver with or without VR goggles. Uh, and uh, you have the state-of-the-art dexterous robot hand built by the Shadow Robot Hand Company. And a very interesting tactile sensor placed at the fingertips. Uh, and by the way, this hand is capable of pretty awesome actions. These sensors are from Syntouch. And through a combination of uh, all these aspects, uh, a user is able to experience what it feels to go perform a complex uh, tactile manipulation. You may have seen some version of these uh, also being uh, tested out in major demonstrations. Uh, you, you had Jeff Bezos play with one of these and everybody uh, blew up about those. In fact, my team even flew all the way out to California just to try out this demonstration uh, because it's a very visceral feeling of what does it feel for a robot to touch something? You know exactly what it feels for you to touch, but what does it feel like for a robot to touch something? So now let's unpack this question. Now, what is the sense of touch? Now, touch means so many different things. At the outset, I'm already gonna tell you something. When we talk about cameras, for instance, in vision-based perception, it is a pretty huge field. There is a massive number of people working on vision-based perception, but what a camera is, is a lot more straightforward uh, uh, object of definition. For instance, a camera is some kind of sensor which is working on the electromagnetic spectrum and which is giving you information in some form which you can process and understand what's going on in the scene. Whereas with a tactile sensor, it's not even one single phenomenon. There's a whole multitude of phenomenon which are being captured. And therefore, what a tactile sensor is, is so closely tied in with what is the transducer which is embedded inside this tactile sensor? So what is the modality which we capture? So I threw in a few examples. Is a tactile sensor something that captures forces? 
something about geometry. It's just like uh, what Meng suggested. Uh, is it's with the forces, we can already throw the question. Does it just tell me on off that the contact happened like Terry suggested? Is it something which can give me some sense of how stable is a grasp? Is it something which can sense slip, which is some kind of relative motion? Are there other phenomenon? Maybe a tactile sensor can tell you the temperature of contact. Maybe it can sense some other properties about the surface, above and beyond a single time snapshot can yield you. Uh, and intentionally, I have thrown a multitude of, uh, of sensors out there. And if you notice a little thing, Right on top left of the spectrum, I have something as simple as the humble FSR. A lot of hobby roboticists play with uh, these four sensitive resistors of that form. All they are is a variable resistor where the more pressure I apply through uh, whatever uh, electronics techniques, that pressure change uh, is conveyed into a voltage change or other forms of uh, signals which can then be read out. So that's, uh, I would say, one very simple kind of sensor in one end of the spectrum. Next, we have our, our most well-known force stock sensors. You covered some uh, aspects of force stock sensors in your previous lecture. Uh, you could say a force stock sensor is also a tactile sensor. And we can talk a bit about where is it not a tactile sensor in terms of uh, what are the limitations of force stock sensor for a complex tactile interaction. And then you have a bunch of examples, everything going from industry grade products such as the Zela Uskin, the Muskin, uh, the Syntouch Biotech, which was used in the demonstration, uh, which you just saw. Uh, and then the BRL, which is the Bristol Robotics Labs TACTIP, uh, and MIT's own GelSight and GelSlim. And then you have the soft bubble, the work which I am currently doing at TRI. And then comes the, the last two, which I want to throw an extra question. Where do you sense touch? Do you want to sense touch on your hands? That is your gripper of your robot, or perhaps do you want to sense touch everywhere, anywhere and everywhere on the body? And then also comes the question, what is the resolution with which we are talking about for the sense of touch, whether it's forces, geometry, slip, etc. There's a spatial resolution aspect, which is how finely it's distributed over the geometry of your robot itself or of your uh, structure itself. And then there's a temporal resolution. How quickly is a tactile sensor able to tell you something happened? So some of these questions have direct analogies, of course, in the camera-based perception world. But nonetheless, these are important questions to assess uh, the different types of tactile sensors. So. Underlying all of these questions is, of course, the, the electronics transduction question, which is how can we sense touch? How are these phenomena conveyed into some form of electronic signal which we can process? And as I said, we will not really get into that too much today. But uh, my more interesting question is how can we use this kind of touch information in our manipulation control loops? So having said that, let's ask the question, why tactile sensing? And there are three ways in which I would like to uh, present the argument for why tactile sensing. The obvious case is there is a biological motivation. Pretty much every living, moving creature around us is able to sense some form of touch, is able to sense some form of contact. And especially if you take something as advanced as the human being, we sense a very powerful form of contact. So we'll understand that. Next, there's, of course, the need for trying to close the loop on contact. And I'll uh, explain a little bit about that statement. And lastly, perhaps our tactile uh, information can give us an enhancement of, uh, of the perception information. And keep in mind, I'm saying uh, you may use other forms of perception all the time, but tactile information can only enhance that perception. So let's start off with this creepy image here, which is from a well-known uh, neuroscience text. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen an image uh, like this. What this image is doing is trying to represent the quantity of your brain matter, which per pertains to uh, each of these uh, organs. And uh, that scaled image on the right is in fact literally showing how much of your brain matter is devoted to uh, understanding the, the sensations coming in from these parts of the body. Note, in, note that this is not quite about the control. This is about processing the sensory information. So as you can see, a huge part of our brain is somehow 
focusing on what our hands are feeling. Uh, there's, of course, your tongue and your lips and your mouth too, because uh, uh, feeding ourselves is a very important human activity. And vision is also an incredibly powerful uh, and incredibly important human activity. But in a sense, uh, I find it intriguing that there's so much brain matter devoted towards tactile sensing. Uh, and I suspect, as do a lot of people, that uh, that it comes down to the fact that tactile sensation is a very complex phenomenon which involves several possible modalities of, of uh, sensations and conveying all of that into meaningful information for control is really what all this brain matter is perhaps doing. Hey, Naveen, the, the yeah. homunculus is just about the sensory cortex, yeah? And the, so yeah. the visual cortex is a whole, it's not right, right. matter, yeah? yeah? This is just sensory cortex and the visual cortex is massive by itself, yeah? Yes, so, yes. Yes, not to not to say that vision is not as important. In fact, this is more about the understanding where your eyes are looking at or something, not so much about what the eye is looking at. So um, yeah, but thank you for the clarification, Russ. So now here's a very interesting uh, demonstration. This was uh, from 2005, this particular experiment. Now, right in our first lecture, we had covered the topic of, uh, or in Russ's first lecture, he had spoken a bit about uh, what's the advantage of having these soft underactuated grippers in the human hands case, what if the fingers were soft and compliant? So in this case, this person has been locally anesthetized in order to not convey any form of uh, tactile sensation from the fingers. I'm not quite sure how they managed uh, that, but essentially the challenge here is the person can see, the person can control their hands, but the person cannot perceived tactile sensation, and they were asked to perform these kind of tasks. Now, the person succeeds. This is clearly telling you that our vision is amazing. Our brains are incredibly good at trying to adapt to a certain uh, situation, such as loss of the sensory uh, sense of modality. And yet, the person fumbles like crazy in what was uh, seemingly a effortless task for most of us. So just taking out a matchstick and uh, lighting a little flame. Now, uh, an equivalent analogy, I'm uh, putting this especially for all the people in uh, countries which experience strong winters is you go out in winter, you suddenly have your, your fingers frozen stiff and it uh, becomes really hard to do otherwise seemingly mundane tasks with your fingers when you're outside without your gloves. So in other words, uh, being compliant and dexterous in manipulation and uh, being equipped with high fidelity visual perception is not always a guarantee of task success. So what is this uh, sense of touch and why does it uh, seemingly help us in this example? Now, let's now jump outside uh, humans because humans are of course a really complicated uh, case. And let's just think purely from the perspective of a robot confronted with the average home. So um, a lot of us uh, in the field of manipulation are interested in putting robots in our homes. So what are the typical situations in homes and why does that lead to confounding our sense of perception? So um, I have a list of uh, issues here and I'll walk through them. Occlusion, which means you can't see a thing which is blocked by another thing. So if you were perhaps interested in spotting a very specific object and trying to uh, perform some tricky manipulation with it, if you occlude yourself, you don't know what exists behind that. Similarly, there's uh, lighting issues in our homes. We are not sitting in our labs with our perfect uh, light sources. Uh, and therefore, lighting issues can tend to confound a vision-based manipulation system. Safety requirements. When you're working at homes, if there is a person near you, you better be careful in how you're behaving. Take care in, not, in order to not uh, cause any harm. And perhaps looking to see if you touch something may not be the fastest way to respond if you touch something. Uh, Clutter, which is a problem you often deal with homes in that a single object is not neatly isolated for you for in order to manipulate. It's often present in a dense uh, cluttered situation where it's surrounded by several other objects and you need to understand how to manipulate it carefully. And object variation, shapes, inertias, et cetera, vary so much even within a single class. For instance, take a class called the coffee mug. There's so many instances of what a coffee mug is and how it weighs and how it feels like to touch and hold. Um, while it might be feasible to ask the question, can you always tell me what's a coffee mug if I gave you an image? It may not always be feasible to ask a question, what's the best way to grip any possible coffee mug if I couldn't have a sense of how it feels like to hold the mug? 
And lastly, of course, our homes. Uh, this is related, of course, to the question of clutter and occlusion, et cetera. Our homes have tight physical constraints. You may often want to manipulate in situations where you have to reach in, put your hand into complex uh, situations to actually manipulate objects. So all these are situations where a sense of touch can only help you. Uh, it's not really going to impede you because these are all situations where our classical perception-based uh, techniques uh, may not necessarily tell you what to do. Now, the other end of the spectrum, I know uh, Russ slightly does not like me showing this uh, exact example, but uh, it's an excellent illustration of uh, why a lot of our uh, robots, especially humanoids uh, face this, uh, suffer from difficulties when they do not know the state of contact. So. These three examples are from the, the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Uh, these were humanoid robots performing this uh, really tricky rescue robot scenario. And uh, each of these examples, which I'm showing here, are due to some form of not knowing the change in state of contact. So I have that noted as a hybridity or contact mode change. Controllers, which try to uh, control these really complex uh, robots in these complicated scenarios often deal with some assumptions on what is the state of the world. For instance, the video on the left, the robot assumed it had made contact with this pretty stiff, uh, what do you call those? I guess valves, yeah, uh, the valve handle. And that contact was necessary in order to execute the next action, which was a high torque action of trying to spin the valve open in the egress task where uh, the, the humanoid from MIT uh, collapses. It was a pretty challenging problem in terms of put your feet on this uh, little step to get off from the car. And while you're getting off, you're making these complex transition from having multiple parts of your body in contact. For instance, uh, the robot's uh, rear is on the seat, the feet are on the ground, but then you're suddenly trying to lift off and moving into a state where only the feet are in contact and not sensing this transition between multiple uh, locations of contact to a fewer set of contact locations uh, often leads to your controller getting confounded. And uh, it then leads to predicting erroneous trajectories for tracking or, uh, or it leads to other kinds of complications where the robot then um, misperforms, malfunctions and leads to some kind of catastrophic conditions. So there's a, this is an obvious need for knowing that a contract transition happened. I want to think about now standing on my feet. I want to think about standing on my feet and being balanced back there, and then I can only move my hands and so on. So that's an obvious case for why tactile sensing uh, makes sense. Now let's ask the question, how would you classify a tactile sensor? So I have thrown one form of classification. If you go pull out the classic uh, literature on on uh, tactile sensors, the, the main reviews, each of them talk about this classification in so many ways. You can talk about the classification in terms of the underlying technology. You can talk about the classification in terms of uh, what are the, the actual modalities which are being sensed. But specifically in manipulation, I want to get your focus on this one spectrum, which is let's think just about forces, the direction in which the force is sensed, and the spatial resolution there uh, in particular, where we are sensing forces on some surface on the robot. On the, on the upper end of the spectrum, you have these uh, simple humble FSRs, which are nice little pressure maps as they are called. So you stick them on a surface, they capture the pressure with which external forces are being applied because an external body is in contact. In the same uh, axis, if you weren't changing the number of measurements from a single point, you have uh, our force torque sensor, which is able to sense all the way up to six different axes of forces and torques. So that's X, Y, Z forces and torques in three different directions. And yet it's sensing all of those aspects from a single reference body. So we are trying to sense what is the net external force or torque as applied on the single body, in this case, the sensor's body. Now, if you move lower on the scale, uh, by the way, I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Let me throw up my pointer. I think now it should be visible. Yeah, okay. So on this end of the scale, you have something like these dense pressure maps distributed all over the surface, like in the eye cup skin. And on the bottom end of the scale, you have the ability to sense uh, at a very high spatial resolution, 
as well as the multiple directions of applied force, not just the normal direction like these, which is through these so-called tense geometry sensors, which is what uh, I would talk a little bit more about uh, in a sec. But just to be clear, we have other criteria with which we can think about these sensors. One is, of course, the temporal resolution, so how frequently we are able to get updates, the processor requirements for these sensors. So cameras, of course, come as a neat package technology, which give you this little cable by which they stream out information in the form of frames or whatever. Now, uh, tactile sensors may or may not come with uh, the associated processing embedded inside the packaging of the sensor itself. So sometimes you may have to do a lot of the processing to understand what happened from raw voltages or whatever. Uh, so that is another way to think about tactile sensors. and. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are other phenomena which I'm not covering in this form of classification. For instance, contact temperature, contact vibration sensing, which is uh, also related to sensing slip. So those are things not present in this 2D plot right here. So let's talk very briefly about these visual tactile or dense geometry sensors, which now indeed is my favorite class of sensor. The video playing up there is the MIT gel site, which came from Ted Adelson's lab. Uh, and uh, it represents uh, one of uh, the classic examples of this new uh, archetype of sensor. So the essence of this uh, is well captured by this image right here. There is some form of external contact. Your robot surface is embedded with some kind of skin. The inner surface of skin, when it deforms, is being uh, observed by this optical system with an imaging sensor. And then you have your image processing work sitting in a computer giving you tactile information. So the slight distinction is unlike, unlike an FT sensor or uh, a pressure map type sensor, there is still quite some processing happening on your, on your solution outside the sensor itself. But the really interesting aspect is, as it said here, with a little typo, by the way, the image analysis part is completely vision-based processing. And that is something which we now have a better and better sense of uh, how to perform this kind of image-based understanding. Now, there are three broad techniques uh, as listed in this uh, review for performing this kind of an action. So uh, there's even a fourth, which I'll talk about in a sec. So either you have a light conductive plate, which is you have an internal light source, in this case, this little LED, and a reflective surface, which is facing inwards on an elastomer medium, which is a, a medium which can be deformed. And once external contact happens on it, light gets deflected, and you're literally looking at the deflected beams of light. The other form is perhaps you don't care about deflecting light itself. You simply embed the surface with these kind of markers and you're looking at marker motion. And later in the stock, we'll dig into what does it mean to observe motion of markers. And lastly, a variant of uh, this format is to instead have this kind of reflective pigment, which directly captures what happens when an external surface suddenly changes the patterns of reflection. Now, uh, this is to say these are vision-based sensors, which are not active, so they're not projecting any form of patterns or et cetera. And now, of course, uh, as you may have covered in your class on uh, doing pose estimation, they are these so-called depth sensors, sensors like the time of flight sensors, which can even, uh, uh, which can even directly measure the distance to a surface. And if you can embed one such sensor into this, into this packaging, you also have a, a more direct form of measuring the distances. So here's a, uh, a quick view of all of these uh, key different uh, types in a way. And I've listed the names of each of these sensors. Let's talk a bit about them. So there's the MIT gel site, which has this uh, reflective surface uh, and it's stuck on top of this uh, elastomer. And uh, you can see what the, the nature of contact is doing to the visual images coming out of the sensor. And by cleverly arranging light sources, you can also con convert this kind of uh, uh, depression directly into a tactile depth map, and it's capable of uh, very high resolutions of sensing. Uh, a related sensor is the, the Bristol Robotics TacTip. Uh, here, instead of uh, having it as a surface which gets deflected, uh, it's a whole elastomer with, uh, 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 with a camera looking up at the surface. 
The CMU finger vision, on the other hand, has markers on this little um, plastic membrane up here. So let's look at that uh, again. And when contact happens, you see the motion of these markers, which are then captured with some kind of uh, vision-based techniques to process. Uh, a couple of other examples, the Tokyo University Gel Force is one of them. The MIT Gel Slim, which is a closely related cousin to the gel site, um, uh, and which also uses similar methods to understand both the depth as well as how external forces are influencing the tactile impressions. And of course, uh, lastly, uh, the TRI's soft bubble sensor, which I will talk a bit about towards the end of this talk. So if you had ended this talk by asking me, what is your favorite sensor? It's one of these. So there you go. I, that's my naked bias on display. <laughs> so now moving on, let's talk a bit about uh, tactile perception. But actually, I would like to quickly ask, are there any questions at this point? No, I'm only seeing four faces because I still haven't mastered Zoom. Oh, there, I see more faces. All right. I am assuming I'm seeing a lot of uh, understanding in your, and comprehension in your faces. So I'm going to proceed at this point. So why is tactile perception important? And uh, I'm, I'm drawing the slight difference between perception and just tactile feedback control for a specific reason. So a lot of manipulation we perform uh, involves precision in hand operations or with very little to no visual attention and take a number of these objects and a number of these uh, tasks which you're used to uh, performing all the time and uh, perhaps uh, recall how much of these tasks involve you actually looking at your hands and trying to see what exactly you're doing. And it turns out a lot of these tasks beyond the most basic visual cues, you're capable quite well of performing them with just the sense of touch alone. So uh, not paying attention uh, is also fine because your tactile system is paying all the attention required to perform a lot of these tasks. Now, let's go back to the robot case. And this ties in uh, very closely to the image I showed before. There are four problems I'm throwing out right here, which specifically call to attention why we need tactile perception above and beyond just camera-based perception. So occlusions, take that uh, lovely home right there. And uh, after a few months of COVID, I'm not sure how many of our homes look like that, uh, but I have a strong suspicion it's quite a few. Then you have tricky visual conditions. Uh, of course, you cannot guarantee perfect uh, lighting sources in our homes. Uh, and quite often you're asked to manipulate without having sufficient lights to see what's going on. On the bottom right, you have this very interesting category, hard to see objects. You can throw in a lot of processing to understand uh, these objects, for instance, with these specular reflections or with uh, which are transparent. But a lot of times, perhaps you don't need to pay that much uh, visual attention because you all know your eyes can lie. On the other hand, uh, you can just go touch the thing and perhaps uh, understand what you are uh, sensing right there. And lastly, any robot is susceptible to self-occlusion because once you actually go reach out and make contact with this object, you're starting to instantly block uh, external perception from uh, even getting a clear view of this uh, object. So especially in the case of these dexterous grippers with these uh, multi of uh, fingers, you quite often tend to occlude yourself. Now, moving on. I threw out uh, a set of uh, tactile perception problems, and I would like to just kind of walk through some of these uh, different problems. And this set here, you can think of as your set of uh, uh, skills, which you can uh, embed in your own robots if you had the right uh, form of, of uh, tactile sensation. So let's walk through this uh, list. So let's start with unexpected contact detection. This ties in exactly with the DRC example, which I presented earlier. Uh, there is a sudden contact, which you didn't expect either on your robot or on the object, which you're trying to manipulate. And you would like to detect that something happened and therefore perform some fast activity to respond. Uh, just a moment here. There we go. So, uh, and the, the three ways which, in general, you can try and uh, compute this is to directly sense forces, to sense contact pressures, 
And uh, the gripper proprioception is, of course, trying to understand where your finger is in space or where the fingers are relative to the gripper itself, and all these kinds of information combined. Now, why I pick out these are because uh, a lot of times these kind of sensory perception tend to be really fast. And when you want to detect an unexpected contact, you want to react really quickly. So you'd like some form of sensory processing where you are able to very quickly glean what has happened to your robot because of uh, external contact. And you perhaps don't really want to sit and uh, number crunch your way towards understanding did contact happen or not. You want to instantly know did contact happen to my robot. The next question here is to detect slip or shear. Specifically, you would like to understand if the object is slipping from your hands or if you're having your hand mounted on a surface, the surface itself is slipping away due to whatever reason. And Shear is a phenomenon which happens on your way towards slip where the object itself is uh, subjected to these tangential forces. And uh, you would often use some kind of force sensing. You may have dedicated hard. Can you hear me? Sorry. It was yeah, all good. Briefly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no and uh, you may need dedicated hardware to perform this kind of slip sensing uh, in order to understand this. The next problem, this goes back pretty much exactly to uh, something Meng men mentioned, which is uh, uh, performing some kind of tacti tactile material discrimination. Now this could be useful for a uh, um, number of high level skills. Like I put my hand into a bag and I'd like to know, am I touching a piece of plastic? Am I touching a piece of wood? Or uh, I'm touching an unknown surface as my robot is egressing. Perhaps knowing what kind of surface it is will quickly help me decide how much weight I can put on my hands. So um, often this kind of material discrimination can be dealt with with uh, classical classic classification techniques as we know in perception. Uh, external force inference is a more expanded version of uh, unexpected contact detection. Perhaps you want to not just say that there's an external force, perhaps you want to actually look at what is the direction of this uh, external force and try to cope with that uh, direction change. Next comes, uh, shape discrimination and uh, the problem which I'm going to kind of heavily focus on for the next phase of this class, which is in-hand pose estimation. And uh, lastly, you can even perhaps touch an object and infer a lot more about the shape of this object through this tactile shape completion uh, style problems. So for today's focus, these are the different problems which we will talk about. Some of these I'll talk about in the context of perception, which is for me always, it means number crunching to understand something about the state of the robot and the world. Uh, and some of these I'll talk in terms of perhaps performing some direct feedback and uh, helping you cope with something unexpected uh, when it happens to your robot. Any question at this point? As I am flipping through your faces, I do see plenty of comprehension, I hope. So I will proceed. So let's take the tactile classification problem. So a number of you understand this context. We have our favorite chancellor rummaging through her handbag. Uh, what if we want to perform something like uh, blind picking? You want to stick your hand into an enclosed surface, pick out a single object. Now. Uh, you don't necessarily need to know what that uh, shape of this object is, but perhaps you just want to know there are different classes of objects and I want to just stick my hand in and pull it out. Now, why can't you do this as an image-based uh, or a vision-based classification problem? This is an enclosed surface. It's kind of hard to actually pick out what is it that you're dealing with. So in this problem, perhaps comes a really important uh, aspect for a vision-based tactile sensor if you want to understand what it looks like to actually make and make contact with this object. So take, for instance, the, the TRI uh, soft bubble gripper here. I'm introducing a number of objects and you see on the top right there, the, the tactile impression created by these objects. So this is the view from the cameras embedded in these kind of tactile sensors. And the instant I am telling you that this is a view of from the cameras of making contact with these objects and these object categories are known, perhaps we can treat it purely as an image classification problem. And that is a problem which we understand pretty well in the world of, uh, of camera-based perception. So this, these images, of course, are from a, a, a well-known image classification work, which is known as the AlexNet. And uh, 
we have these different classes of uh, images and from the pixel information, we would like to know what is the class of this object, either as a probability or you just wanna say, this is the most, uh, the, the class that I directly infer just from the pixel information. So uh, let's take uh, one of these uh, networks, which is uh, pretty well known for uh, how well it has performed on some benchmark data sets. It's known as the ResNet or the Residual Network uh, Image Classifier. For, for more information, I recommend you dig into the, the actual source paper, but suffice to say, we are using a convolutional neural network. And uh, in this particular instance, what I'm illustrating is the so-called uh, ResNet 50 model. So with uh, the 50 refers to the number of uh, hidden layers in the problem. And uh, the actual classification part really comes out with a class probability and a label for the class. So uh, in the case of tactile images, if you had classes and if you had images, sufficient amount of training information, you can treat it exactly as a ResNet problem. And that was indeed something we showed in one of our works in 2019. And several other uh, tactile sensor works have done some kind of classification. I just picked our work simply because I have nice GIFs to show you what's going on. Now, uh, the key interesting aspect which you have to keep in mind is why is it hard to perform tactile classification as opposed to camera-based classification? And the answer is quite simple. In a camera-based world, it isn't quite as expensive to obtain labeled images. You can stick a camera on a scene, you can move around with your camera, and you can sit there annotating these images or farm it out to the cloud or get an outsource that information to a company to sit and draw uh, or mark out what are the objects you see in a scene. Whereas in a tactile case, you actually have to go reach out and touch the object and repeatedly touch the object to get a sense of what all are the possible ways in which this object can be touched to obtain your corpus of images to train your network. Now, what does this entail? Anything which is making contact is slowly degrading or abrading. You're literally reducing the lifetime of your sensor with every single contact you make. So in other words, Tactile classification starts becoming challenging from the perspective of, it's not that easy to suddenly obtain a corpus of a uh, few tens of thousands of images, because for each of those tens of thousands of images, you should have made tens of thousands of contacts. So this is quite the same as saying a robot should sit there playing with objects repeatedly in order to get a sense of what all one single object means. So this is usually the, the tricky nature of performing some kind of uh, tactile classification, which is how do you give it enough training information in, a, in an effective way. Now, one part of this problem we tackled at uh, TRI was to simply perform some kind of uh, automated labeling. In this uh, particular instance, what you're seeing is the scene in front of the robot filled with a single class. In this particular instance, the class is called mug. Now, I mentioned two factors here. One is the amount of training data you can create inside an hour, which is usually a determinant of how well a classifier works. And the second aspect here is also a key, uh, a key aspect to think about when it comes to making tactile contact. The uniqueness of a grasp is key to classification success. So it's not the number of training images per se. You could have tens of thousands of images of dogs in a scene uh, and train a network to classify if an image contains a dog. But in the case of what is a mug, you perhaps need to capture every possible instance of a mug being held in your hand. Now I have a coffee mug in my hand. There's a lot of possible ways in which you can gras grasp this possible mug. So quite often, this also tends to be uh, a determinant of your success when you're using some kind of uh, deep learning network or some other kind of machine learning technique in order to perform these kind of uh, perception tasks. How do you create the right corpus? And uh, there's no one short answer. The answer is perhaps something in between. Find a more uh, data efficient way to perform your machine learning. Perhaps you need to find a, a more efficient way in which you can make contact. And of course, make your sensor itself way more robust that it doesn't even matter if I were to make tens of thousands of hours of contact. And perhaps that sensor is sitting out in your lab, sitting and sensing, and you can transfer that learning to another tactile sensor, which is deployed in the field. So. And this transfer learning aspect is also a challenging question when it comes to tactile sensors, because 
it's not always the same for two different sensors to sense the same phenomenon and give you the exact same outputs. So, there may be minor differences between each sensor due to the nature of the contacts. Yeah. I've got a question about that exactly. Go ahead. So, you know, mm -hmm. any two cameras have different distortion models and that doesn't seem to have impaired the ability of, of you know, image classification tasks from being able to do what they need to do. How much does it really matter that your sensor is degrading or ch changing over time as you do these tests? Isn't that, mm -hmm. like, I guess what, I, what I'm leading to is, is it sufficient for one, one research lab to generate a corpus that another research mm -hmm. lab can then use on their sensor? Is there, is there enough, you know, at least within the same class of, you know, sensors, gel sites, or, or something like that along those lines to be able to deal with the fact that yes, while mm -hmm. we've only, you know, the, the image net that you then fine tune on your specific sensor or, or something, is, is, that, is that in the realm of practicality? So there, that's an excellent question. And I'd like to unpack it in two possible ways. So you hit the nail on one aspect of it, can you train on one kind of sensor and deploy to another variant of the same sensor? Perhaps that can be done. And there are indeed some works out there where people investigate this exact question. Now, what makes it kind of challenging is our contact physics may be slightly different. And uh, perhaps there may exist a corner case of this object being grasped in this particular way, which we did never experience before, leading to a completely different tactile perception, simply due to the nature of how your sensor is uh, uh, making contact with this particular object. Now, when it comes to generalizing across sensors, that's a way harder question, simply because what each sensor senses is so unique to the physics of how the sensor itself uh, has been built. And I'm specifically talking about uh, how, how compliant the sensor is, how much of the surface the sensor is measuring, what is the resolution of the surface geometry that you're sampling. All it comes down to really saying is, can there be some way of understanding that a grasp at this point of the mug is almost the same as a grasp at this point of the mug in terms of telling that it's the mug. Now, you know for a fact that from your own sensation, if I were to give you something vaguely cylindrical, something made of ceramic, you'd probably just guess it's a mug until I gave you extra information to tell you that it's a mug. And all of us have fumbled around in the dark to know that we can confound ourselves uh, sometimes with tactile sensation. So you do need a huge corpus. So the unfortunate answer for your question is there's no straightforward way. And indeed, it's an open research topic in how do we find a data efficient way to train on these kind of uh, tactile sensors. Does it answer your question with this non-answer? Kind of. Um, it's, it's more you know, in some senses, ImageNet broke up wide open people doing tons of things and with, with, and, and it, is that all it would take is take, you know, all the different types of sensors out there, you know, have, have, have 10 different research labs, each of them generate a hundred thousand images with their, and, and put it all into one data set and turn the deep learning crank. Is, 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 is that, is that in the realm of practicality? Not, I'm not saying is it practical. <laughs> I do think that is in the realm of practicality. Um, I mean, the same example could also be turned around and saying a single robot, as it keeps performing tasks, encountering new objects, can it add it to its corpus of uh, known objects? So perform some kind of uh, lifelong learning. So either learn from other agents or learn from your own experience and uh, grow your corpus. Now, the second aspect is literally uh, something we tackle. So I don't see why not the first aspect. Uh, and generalizing across sensors, if we were to find a concise set of parameters, something as simple as the camera intrinsics, we could uh, perhaps find a way to generalize between sensors. If we were to find the minimal number of parameters which define the way one sensor behaves uh, and figure out why each tactile sensor of a same instance is slightly different. But I do agree what you said is totally within the realm of possibility. Uh, but the more we investigate a data efficient learning strategy, the better off we are because at the end of the day, every sensor which makes contact abrades, degrades. And that is something which a camera based uh, uh, thinking does not really entail. You don't, 
you don't lose off lifetime of your camera every time you turn it on in the, quite the same way as a tactile sensor so that's really my point but good question anyway so yeah there was somebody else perhaps just some loud muting so this is uh, incidentally the result of performing that kind of uh, training by letting our robot self explore and learn objects uh, we would joke and call this the apples to bubbles comparison because uh, you have this scene which uh, let's restart the video as i talk you had the scene which uh, comprised of objects which need to end up in the dishwasher such as mugs and objects which need to be thrown away such as trash in the form of uh, these pet bottles and so on and really could we train the robot to simply from a single touch or uh, learn to understand what is it that is being touched now uh, in this particular instance i don't want to say this is true for all time if you were to use tactile sensation and perform this classification uh, end to end we do achieve some uh, gains in this case uh, a 45 second uh, shaving off the total time now what that means in the view on the right you had the robot pick out an object and if it is sure what it is from camera based techniques go deposit it in the dishwasher now keep watching that scene on the right you see the object robot pick out an object and singulate it to let camera based techniques tell better if it's trash or not and part of that is because when you're going in grabbing an object you tend to occlude the scene and telling what's in a scene when you're partially occluding is a lot harder whereas with the tactile sensor you're not really going to occlude your own tactile sensor that's in a way the beauty of uh, tactile sensation which is if you're occluding you're touching something else and if you want to tell what you're touching you're literally touching that thing so you don't have the question of uh, occluding your tactile images uh, really and that leads to some speed up are we clear on classification before i move on i think you made a super good point in in the middle there i want to make sure it lands which is that you you're getting a very different view of an object when you're touching it's a much more local view right than uh, than the more global view that you'd get from a camera looking at it from away. So like your example with the mug, I think was perfect, right? So the fact that you're just seeing the curvature and you're asking yourself, can you identify the whole mug? It seems like a very different problem than seeing it from a distance and getting a more global perspective. So you like right. end up having to think about texture of the mugs and are being the important cues instead of like, you know, it's got a handle, right? So it's super interesting to think about. There's also a question from And it's uh, it's a great point and yeah go ahead Terry Oh I was just going to say there's oh, sorry, a question somebody spoke Does the model work with tactile sensor images Ah That's that's a great point and we'll briefly talk about it towards the the last part of the stock can you have a known model for what a tactile sensor can actually perceive so is there a is there a, a sensor independent way of saying what is a tactile sensation you expect from this particular object or even a sensor dependent way and uh, that expectation is a hard problem until you fully understand the physics of the tactile uh, sensation itself now i also want to emphasize in this particular mug example what we tend to think of as visual features in a camera based world a quite different from what are interesting features in a tactile world so uh something which is uh which has confounded us in camera based perception is this perfectly blank featureless surface like a big white wall now an equivalent in the world of tactile is a perfectly uniform material it doesn't even man- matter what shape it is if it has no features as long as it's uniform in its curvature exactly like uh, the surface of this mug so for a tactile sensor this mug surface is highly confounding it's not easy to understand how is this surface different from this surface different from this surface there may be microscopic differences but uh, do we really want to process information at that level of spatial scale uh, and these are challenging questions when it comes to classification and a lot of these questions also quite nicely tie in to our next problem which i'm going to talk about now which is in hand pose estimation so why do we need to perform tactile pose estimation now you had i think two lectures on the topic of uh, pose estimation using camera based techniques specifically using uh, these depth sensors or of uh, different uh, formats so you know that camera based perception can work or uh, may have issues in working under some specific considerations but 
uh, why do you even want to think about this in hand pose estimation problem? And that's what I want to talk about. So the first thing is uh, right at the beginning, as I mentioned before, again, uh, we know that we can be kind of open loopy with a sufficiently compliant gripper. We have all seen these beautiful videos of robots rummaging through piles of stuff and picking a thing and placing it elsewhere without really reasoning about what they touched as long as they know that they are holding something in a loose sense. So sometimes that is not enough to tell you how you're holding an object. On the image on the left, you have an interesting comparison. So what you had was the robot reaching in into the clutter. Uh, this is the robot at TRI, for instance, grabbing a mug with some hypothesis about what was the pose of the mug coming in from the cameras. And the robot then picks up this mug. And on the camera frame, we are now trying to compare the difference between the expected mug pose, which is in the translucent shaded color, and the actual mug pose, which is in the colored image in the form of red. Now, it looks subtle, but that's a pretty important distinction for an object such as a ceramic mug. Why is that the case? So first and foremost, why did this difference even happen? Now, the difference happens obviously because contact is a complicated phenomenon, especially when you're contacting with two surfaces such as a gripper. A lot of things happen in the small few uh, milliseconds as you're starting to make contact, which push an object away from where you expect it to be. And it ends up at uh, some other location in space, uh, which is really where this uh, problem comes from. But second, this small distinction really starts affecting us if you want to perform some precision action after you grasp an object. And that's an important point. If you were to simply pick an object and place it, you perhaps don't need in hand post estimation. You really need post estimation only if you really need to understand how you want to place it. Perhaps the object is fragile, like a mug. It needs to be placed in a specific way. It cannot just be dropped. Perhaps the object has very specific uh, requirements based on what it's containing. For instance, maybe it's a coffee filled mug. I want to hold it always with the top upright. I don't want to jostle it or move it all the way around when I'm grabbing it. So I want to keep track of, is it pointed upright? So these are all uh, tricky questions. And of course, not to mention our favorite example, as I listed before, self occlusion and camera based uh, uh, problems may also uh, fall into this realm. You can keep looking at your hands with your eyesight, but quite often your hands would cover your eyesight, making it an extra hard post estimation problem, um, as you might know from your work in post estimation earlier in this lecture. So let's study this uh, problem definition. We have this gripper. I just drew this uh, fictitious gripper holding this object B. The gripper has an associated reference frame G, and we have this measurement set Y. Now, what this Y is, let us say we have a uh, perfect knowledge of the kinematics of the gripper. And somehow, some kind of tactile sensation is giving you, let's say, just on off measurements. And it's able to tell you what each of these points are the points being P1, P2, P3, P4, where contact is happening between this surface and this surface. Let's now consider it's a rigid case. The fingers don't comply. The object is rigid. So there are discrete contact points here, which we are dealing with. Now in these discrete contact points, if I were to know the location of each of these points, P1, P2, P3, P4, in the reference frame G, you have this nice neat measurement set GY. Uh, the qualifier for this uh, measurement set, of course, comes through these observations, which are the kinematics of the robot coming in through the encoders, uh, kinematics of the gripper. So the set Q1 uh, and so on. I think that's a typo that should be QN here. And let us say we know the object model. We are not talking about uh, trying to guess the pose of a completely unknown object. We somehow know uh, what is the complete set of points in the object reference frame which is every possible point on the shape of this, uh, on the surface of this object. And surface is an important uh, aspect. So for a rigid gripper, you can say the tactile sensors on the surface and Y of theta is a constant. Uh, in other words, it doesn't quite uh, depend on how much pressure you're applying on the contact. The set of contact points are the same regardless how much pressure you push in into each of the contacts. So. We'll talk a little bit about flexible grippers later, but suffice to say, you have a contact surface, not discrete contact points, but you could also sample on that surface and obtain a similar set of measurement points. Now, now we can ask the question, estimate GXB, which is 
the pose of this object in my reference frame G. Now we can ask the question, what makes this problem particularly hard? So first and foremost, it's an ill pose problem by its nature. There is a non-unique uh, solution. If I simply gave you uh, these given parameters and asked you to uh, estimate GXP, there could be several possible poses of this object which satisfy uh, this set of measurements. And second, uh, noise, of course, can heavily affect us because our notion of where these points are comes entirely from the idea that a tactile sensor has said what the points are, P1, P2, P3, P4. Perhaps a neighboring tactile sensor fired when it shouldn't have fired because of sensor noise. Then our sense of the set of uh, measurements, Y would change and that can confound us. Second, the pose estimate is highly constrained. And this is an important point. We are not talking about an object in 3D space with nothing around it. The robot is in your gripper. So in other words, the robot cannot be inside your gripper and cannot be away from your gripper. It is in contact, it's touching your gripper, and that's a hard fact that you know. So we should uh, think about how that, that constraint affects our pose estimate. The initial guess may be crucial. Uh, and this is something we already know of in other kinds of post estimation problems. And it might require a pretty precise object model. How much of uh, the object knowledge do you need to know that is the set uh, BPI? So how much, how, at what resolution do you need to know the object itself in order to perform this uh, action? And of course, uh, with a tactile sensor, like any other sensor, there may be temporal effects. So this is related to the noise question, uh, in, as I mentioned earlier. So if you simply look at this problem definition, you notice that by structure, it's very similar to another problem which uh, you have studied, which is of course, uh, depth registration. So you have a model, you have a set of measurements and you're asked to find the transform between your scene and your model or the other way, depending on how you post the question. So all of you know the Stanford bunny and uh, Russ mentioned that you have even done that as an exercise. So. Uh, it's it's not too hard for me to explain what is it that we are trying to do. So the flowchart on the left is, of course, the steps of the well-known ICP or the iterative closest point uh, algorithm. So which is saying, given two point sets, find the transformation that aligns them. In the simplest form, it's an iterative process of taking your set of points and finding uh, the pose such that the distance to the nearest point on the model are minimized. and you shake up the little bag of points uh, and you repeat the process. Shake up the bag of points, repeat the process until you're satisfied that you have hit the goal. Now, uh, in the case of uh, these kind of dense geometry tactile sensors, and by the way, I should uh, mention this, I will interchangeably keep using the terms camera-based tactile sensor, visual tactile sensor, dense geometry sensor, all to mean the same thing a camera inside a soft structure, which is going to go make contact with the surface. So dense geometry sensors don't just estimate discrete contact points, but sample the geometry of a deformable surface. So the whole sensor surface deforms and you sample that structure in discrete locations, but the sensor itself makes contact continuously with this object. And the pose estimation problem can thus be treated as a registration problem. And I have illustrated the depth maps coming from each of these sensors here, just for you to visualize what it looks like for a sensor to actually go touch an object and obtain a depth map. Now, this was one example of us performing uh, this kind of depth registration using an early instance of the soft bubble sensor. This was the bigger format, which was at the end of the arm. That image you see here is uh, the ICP fit of trying to figure out what is the pose of this uh, known simple geometry, which is uh, that of a tetrahedral, what is this called? Uh, wait, I suddenly forgot the name of the shape. Um, <laughs> doesn't matter. Uh, you touch the shape, you have a known model of the shape. We, inst uh, we incidentally 3D printed shapes so that we know exactly what is the shape that you're trying to uh, make contact with. And uh, from this contact, you have this point cloud obtained from your sensor itself in red and blue is the fit of the sensor, uh, of fit of the pose inside the sensor measurement. And the interesting point is your, all your measurements of, uh, or all your computations of pose estimates uh, through the depth registration technique would uh, effectively be computations of the pose in the camera frame of the embedded uh, camera 
In other words, you're computing everything in your local gripper frame, which is why I would call this an in-hand pose estimation problem, uh, as opposed to a global pose estimation from an external camera or so on. Now, what makes this problem hard? That was a nice, neat demo. You saw a nice video um, showing the result of performing that. Well, it turns out it's actually a pretty annoyingly hard problem because there are several uh, uh, effects which make this uh, really tricky. One, you have dealt with in your own lecture. This is a really local problem, so you need a really good guess somehow. Second, you may often have confusion from non-contacted parts of an image because here's another little distinction between a tactile sensor and something like a camera-based sensor. A camera can quite often treat pixels as independent. You can treat parts of the scene which are not looking at an object as being completely independent to the actual object. Whereas tactile sensors can deform everywhere. So if you're simply sensing deformations, you're looking at every part of your image changing a bit but actually what you want to pay attention to is only the part in contact with your sensor. So that makes it a little bit more tricky. Constraints are not captured in a vanilla ICP uh, formulation. So what are the constraints I mentioned? The object post cannot be inside your sensor. The object post cannot be away from your sensor because the contact has happened at the sensor surface. That is one hard fact that you know. And lastly, if you were to use these kind of uh, straight uh, direct depth registration methods like ICP, you tend to be highly dependent on features on the geometry itself, uh, like corner features and so on. And that, oh, now I got the shape. It's called a pyramidal frustrum. So with these pyramidal frustrums, you often have these nice convenient features like corners. So this was a cherry picked example uh, intentionally to show you that ICP can work. If I were to pick a shape with all kinds of uh, weird topological features, perhaps ICP may not converge smoothly. So let's try to break this down and think about how we can improve our post estimation. First, let's tackle the question of being extremely local. Now, this is one example from literature out there. This is from Alberto's lab, uh, where they uh, used a, a, a pretty straightforward way to guess what is the initial condition with which we want to uh, then infer the pose estimates. So in other words, if we are very local, perhaps we need a guess which is close enough. And uh, what's the technique we all love these days? Let's throw a deep network at it. So, and uh, it turns out it's quite possible uh, using a network. In this particular instance, what they did was to obtain a whole set of tactile imprints, quite similar to the classification uh, example I spoke of before. And from these uh, tactile imprints, what we would like to know is an initial guess for what is the closest tactile imprint to the imprint I have right now, which is something like an image matching problem. I'm giving you one image and asking you to find the, the image in my corpus, which closest matches this image. And from that, you immediately have an initialization of the pose of this uh, object, which you can then use to initialize some ICP style technique. So this, I would suggest, let's, let's watch the video briefly while I uh, continue speaking. But uh, you essentially have these kind of tactile imprints from holding these objects. This is the gel slim tactile sensor. And from these tactile imprints, we are able to then uh, pre-initialize and then perform some kind of pose estimation, uh, which is a bit more robust to the initialization error. The other way of uh, of getting over this initialization error is also if you use the vision-based technique to actually go in and grasp an object, perhaps your initial pose before you made contact is a good enough guess for uh, where contact actually happened. So that would be the other way of uh, inferring this. But that is assuming a camera was looking at your scene before you made contact. So let's pick out item number two, confusion from non-contacted parts of this image. So in some sensors, for instance, the TRI uh, soft bubbles, you have deformation which happens all over. So what is this particular soft bubble sensor? It's, uh, it's a time of flight sensor embedded behind this little balloon. It's a stretched elastic membrane. It's an air filled chamber. So it deforms exactly like what you expect a balloon would deform. It's in fact a latex membrane. And as you're pushing into this latex membrane, you have these depth measurements. So the whole membrane therefore deforms when contact happens. And therefore it's important to try and resolve this confusion between the non-contacted and the contacted part of this image. 
Now, how this was solved in our work was uh, something I'll briefly talk about in greater detail later. But for now, suffice to say, there's a lot of number crunching which goes on, which try to understand how a membrane deforms when contact happens. And through this prior model of understanding how deformation happens on this uh, membrane, you can then ask an inverse question, which is if I gave you a bunch of measurements, what would be the most likely subset of measurements which resulted in that deformation on this object surface? So, which is a bit of the, uh, the which is why it's an inverse problem. The forward problem would be, if I gave you an object and I gave you this membrane, tell me how this membrane deforms. And now we are asking the opposite. I gave you a bunch of measurements. What would be the possible uh, set of deformations which resulted in this membrane deforming? And that gives us a concise set, which we call the contact patch, which is a part of the tactile sensor surface, which is in direct contact with this external object. So from this contact patch, what you can do is, uh, so you're seeing in this particular video here, live tracking of the contact patch as I'm pushing in different objects into the surface of the sensor. And you'll notice there are some features which are missed and occasionally there are uh, holes and other issues, but for the most part, it is able to quite nicely capture the shape of this object. For instance, it's able to discriminate the, the inner surface of this uh, of this uh, elastic, uh, no, of this tape wasn't uh, really part of the patch. Same was for the gap between the feet and so on. And if I were to only use that part of the scene for doing pose estimation, I have a much more culled set of points. Now, an equivalent in a camera-based world would be to use some kind of masking. And I know that you have uh, gone through the mask RCNN uh, problem. So perhaps the, uh, the closest analogy for performing this is to simply take an image mask, use the depth values coming in purely from the mask, and then using that to perform your registration. And it turns out that leads to some level of, uh, of uh, robustness from this confusion with the non-contacted parts of the image. It doesn't quite solve the problem yet, but we now have two possible solutions to this tricky challenge. Any questions at this point? Just have to uh, give you a time check. I know you have so much more material, but we only have a few minutes left. So just make oh. sure you're watching the time. Okay. Uh, I, I, I did, it did slip my mind. So let's jump ahead. Now, this part, I don't quite need to uh, get into great detail because uh, it has been covered in your previous lecture, which is, uh, of course, performing some kind of dark based tracking. Now, the key insight here was to utilize these so called sine distance functions to overcome correspondence issues. Now, I really want to focus on one little uh, trick to enhance what uh, we have seen in DART. So take the gel site tactile sensor and see that the depth image is essentially something you can represent as a set of points in space. Because if you know the kinematics of your robot, and if you know the gripper position at this point in time, you also directly have a measurement of a set of points in space. And uh, this is exactly what Greg uh, did in his work, which is he utilized simultaneous point clouds. and uh, there were some uh, mathematical issues he dealt with in uh, speeding up this problem, but uh, we don't need to get into those details. But essentially, it comes down to combining depth images from your uh, tactile sensor with depth images coming from an external perception system, like a depth camera looking at the scene, will effectively lead us to do a dart style optimization which makes us more robust. So that is literally what this problem is doing in this task of uh, figuring out the pose of this uh, pen-like object, a screwdriver, and inserting it into this uh, hole. So um, I don't want to get into greater detail. I am running out of time, which I didn't realize. So let's now jump into uh, a, a few tactile control examples. Hopefully, I can go through them. Now, the first. Uh, subset of examples. Again, I don't need to repeat because you have already covered it in a way in your previous class. When pose information is available and the object itself is rigid, you can treat it as a forceful manipulation problem, which is a force or compliance control problem. So this comes into some of the nomenclature. A lot of people tend to think of a force stock sensor as a very simplistic tactile sensor. So if you were to perform some kind of force control or impedance control strategy, it's still for me a kind of tactile uh, control. Now, if you did not have the post information of this object a priori, 
you could enhance by doing some kind of tactile pose estimation in this particular paper. They combine an FT sensor with a camera instead of a dense tactile sensor with a camera, track the shape of this object. And in this case, they are performing a task of uh, planar pushing. But let's go really into the next example, which is where I hope to have a little bit more of time. Uh, we can skip this for this particular instance, but the slides are available for you. Okay, now a lot of tactile sensors out there are uh, now capable of uh, tracking shear forces. And uh, the technique they often employ is some form of markers on the sensor surface, which moves due to external contact. You're now looking at uh, three different uh, forms of uh, external contact and how they influence uh, how these little markers, dots are moving, for instance, in a normal direction, in an in-plane direction, and in a shear and tilt direction. So this is from this work from GelSight. Now, how can we track the motion of individual parts of the scene? Well, it turns out, again, in computer vision literature, this is a well-known problem, which is known as optic flow. And uh, optic flow, which I will not get into details right now, is uh, simply trying to understand for a given pixel, which way is it most likely uh, that particular pixel is moving if I gave you a new image. So between two images, we are looking at each pixel and trying to guess which way that pixel has moved. And the power of optic flow methods is in a dynamic scene like tracking a road, you can actually tell what parts of the scene have changed and in which way the change is happening. Now in a tactile sensor, like for instance, the TRI soft bubble, the same principle applies. We have dots embedded on the structure. In this case, they are uh, printed on the surface and we can track the motion of these kind of dots. So this uh, little video here is uh, showing the tracking of these dots on this object as uh, we are going in and touching. On the bottom part of the scene, uh, you're looking at uh, the different parts of the image, uh, the IR images here. And we have two sets of images, what's known as a reference image and a current image. And the distance, the, the optic flow is the problem of tracking each pixel in these two images, how they have moved. And it turns out with simply by looking at the way each of these pixels are moving, you have a quite a good guess of the shear forces happening as the person is pulling and pushing on this object. Now, what can you do with this information? You can do a pretty powerful form of control without really thinking and reasoning too hard. In this particular instance, which is uh, a blind object stacking, and I intentionally picked these uh, transparent objects, uh, just to illustrate the point, the robot is simply commanded to move downwards until sufficient shear is detected and at which point it lets go. And it turns out with these kind of uh, objects with flat surfaces and flat bottoms, it would just keep doing this indefinitely and leading to stacking. What was the, the controller which actually led to this action? The controller was very simple. It said, keep moving until uh, force threshold is, le uh, is reached. Uh, which is to say that sufficient shear has been detected. Now you could do this kind of an action also with the four stock sensor, that is uh, not to say that, but in this kind of soft sensors, you do have a lot more advantages in grabbing an object. So we are close on time. So I'm really gonna try and run through. I unfortunately have to skip this example, but uh, let's actually go into the outlook question. So there were two parts. One, let's combine softness with tactileness. And that is uh, indeed one of my take home messages, which is uh, we have a huge history of compliant grippers out there, but why not combine both these stories of a compliant gripper with a tactile sensor? So you actually know what's happening in between your grasp and in between placing. And there's several reasons why we would like to know that, uh, which is kind of similar to our earlier story. And again, going back the soft bubble sensor, which contains a membrane and this kind of uh, depth sensor embedded, leads us to perform these kind of uh, uh, tracking uh, problems. So in this case, this is a gripper form of the same sensor. And uh, I'm just gonna leave this uh, video out there for, uh, you will look at it again in the last slide, but let me preempt your question on simulation and just answer this part very quickly. How can we simulate a tactile sensor? Turns out we have the vocabulary, but putting in the pieces together, is very unique and dependent on the kind of sensor. In the example on the bottom right here, you're uh, seeing a Drake style simulation, simulating the tactile perception of 
uh, making contact with an object. And what it is is nothing but a depth camera inside a surface, which is allowed to penetrate and touch this external surface. So simulating the depth, depth part is quite straightforward. What is the hard part of this problem? Simulating the realistic contact physics here. And uh, we have, I know Russ has covered some of these questions earlier in this lecture. So essentially my answer to, can you simulate a sensor is, can you get the contact physics right for your instance of tactile sensor? And can you appropriately capture the noise model? If you can do these things, any tactile sensor is simulatable. And uh, that is one of my uh, key take home messages. So since we are out of time and I just do want to have one or two quick questions uh, towards the end, I want to shamelessly throw a plug. We have internship positions open. Uh, there's a lot of material out there if you're interested in understanding what TRI has been up to. And while we are discussing that, I'll leave our video on the soft bubble grippers and do email me if you're interested in working on problems on tactile perception. But unfortunately, that's it for today. Uh, any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, Naveen. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Or I was going to ask, um, so like most of the sensors you talked about were like vision based. Do you find that like the camera frame rate is ever a limitation for problems that you want to work on? Where, cause I imagine for like, for, for tactile, you could do things at like a much higher frame rate or a much higher like sensing rate. Um, there might be like so, some sort of. <laughs> uh, there are two answers to the question, just like any other camera based perception. Uh, if you want to do things faster, you can always try and uh, look for a custom sensor which does things a lot faster with a lot fewer pixels, for instance. So for uh, it may entirely depend on the nature of your problem. You could try and find yourself a custom imaging sensor, which is uh, not quite at the resolution uh, you need for a whole scene, but at a much lower resolution can sample a lot faster. You also have some tactile sensation, uh, sensory work out there where they embed even driven cameras or dynamic vision sensors into the scene. If any of you are uh, familiar with these kind of sensors, people have tried to embed them into these kind of uh, sensors too. And that captures a lot of phenomenon. But I'd also like to emphasize putting a camera inside sensors, not the be all and end all. It's a very good solution for certain kinds of perception. Perhaps you want to work really fast. You don't need a camera inside the sensor. We simply want to sense something much faster, which is the vibrations, which could be sensed through acoustic techniques, which could be sensed through accelerometers and so on. So a simple example is stick a microphone in your sensor. You're going to sense things really fast. For instance, impulses or the sensation of dragging your finger over a surface. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. It's super interesting, right? When the one of the common things that I've heard you say and I've heard other people say is that if you're trying to wait for the onset of or detect the onset of slip, if something's like going to slip out of your hands, it's so hard to detect it and actually react to it in 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 a time frame that would be useful, right? Um, that's I think that's a really you know acute place where the the bandwidth question comes in is, and it's a closed loop question really, right? Could you even if you could sense it, you know, could you react fast enough? Right. In fact, uh, with a paddle gripper, what can you do? You can just jam harder and hope that uh, your normal forces are sufficient to prevent slippage happening. And uh, that's a, in, even in that simple example, uh, closing the loop to jam harder is really tricky because uh, a lot of times slip is a phenomenon which happens so fast and uh, at best you can only tell that slippage happened and uh, coping with it fast is a tricky challenge. So uh, there are some times when you could intentionally control slip, for instance, letting an object uh, rotate in your, between your fingers. And that might be a feasible uh, way to utilize slip sensing uh, rather than just coping with slip and trying to grab it and hope that you haven't completely let go of the object. Okay, any other questions? I'm just gonna flip through your faces. <laughs> So you showed some examples of using force feedback for control. Do you ever think about using like tactile localization and estimating the pose of the object in a control framework or do you mainly do more reactive things like with forces? So this is a, a really good question. There are two ways in which you wanna think about it. If you expect the pose will change and you wanna cope for the pose change as you're manipulating an object. So when it is in contact, 
you would be actually trying to write a feedback controller using a tactile pose. Now, more often than not, especially in these uh, parallel gripper examples where you're picking and placing in a complex scene, the pose change is a resultant of an unexpected contact. So it's more like you actually want to cope with uh, something unexpected happening rather than actively control. Now, an active control example might be closer to what I just said with the slippage. Maybe you want to have control slip and keep looking at the object while you're letting it slip or slide between your fingers. Now, again, my gut feeling about this problem is perhaps trying to use a tactile sensor to control pose continuously may be the wrong kind of problem. But uh, it doesn't mean it's, uh, uh, it's the wrong problem for uh, a behavioral level switching. You could, for instance, use the pose and perhaps change your robot's trajectory uh, mid-flight on what you're performing. So that is, I'd like to just slightly draw a distinction between behavioral level control and actually writing a feedback stabilized controller using the pose. So my non-answer is it's really hard. I would rather use the tactile sensor to cope with uh, an unknown uh, state or do behavioral switching. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, I mean, T Tony, who just asked that is from Alberto's group. And uh, so I guess thinking about Nikhil's work, for instance, of like, you know, the non prehensile, I, I guess I haven't talked about it in lecture yet, but. Of, of like moving the MIT around and then having a, sorry, his is prehensile in that case, but but causing um, like the in-hand reorientations using world contact. Mm -hmm. That seems like one case. And 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 we have, a, uh, you have an example of, of reorienting a mug by making intentional contact with the world and tracking that in-hand reorientation with the, uh, with the pose estimate, you know, tactile pose estimation, right? Yes. So, so there are so, definitely cases where you could do it and would want to do it, right? Yes. Uh, the only caveat I want to add is your actual hardware behind the tactile sensor is a lot more complex. It's the entire gripper, it's a, uh, gripper and the entire robot itself, which is performing the control. So if this entire chain is capable of reacting fast enough, that is the speed of reaction which you want to sense. So this particular instance is exactly yeah, right what there. Russ mentioned. So uh, let me go back to this example. We are trying to flip this object, in this case, this mug, by making intentional contact with the edge of this uh, uh, this world. In this particular instance, the pose estimate is used to understand if it can indeed flip. And you can then come up with a plan which can then cause this uh, flip to happen, perhaps through Nichols' work or so on. Now, it is my feeling that you could write this as a pose feedback problem and uh, try and speed up this pose estimation problem. The obvious trick I would throw at this is down sample and therefore let your pose estimator run way faster than normal. But still you would be limited uh, to the peak frequency of the camera in your pose estimates. And uh, I think slowing it down, slowing the task itself down is one obvious way in which we can actually write a feedback controller which uses pose. In this particular instance, it's more a behavioral level fl flipping. What I did was to query the pose, perform this action, and based on the pose in hand, slightly change the trajectory in which I was placing the object down on the surface. So again, my answer is there are tricks in play where we can write a feedback controller with pose. Uh, and all those tricks require basically trying your best to speed up the sensory information. The control part is of course limited by your control bandwidth uh, in this particular problem but it's doable, it's not uh, impossible. I do like to think more about forces than uh, pure pose, simply because force is something I often like to imagine. You can't directly obtain from a camera. You can infer it. You can know something about the world and use your pixels to guess force happen. Whereas a tactile sensor sees force. And that's a huge distinction why I like to think about force-based problems rather than purely geometric-based problems. I guess on a related note, um, what do you think about like force torque sensors, which is just like one data point related to the force and the torque versus distributed um, force that you can